Hello, welcome back to this uh, basic 3D Studio Max set of tutorials. Um, my name's Alex P. Twig, and we're going to pick up where we left off. Um, in the first video, we uh, created the basic geometry for our scene, and now what we're going to do is look at how to set it up so we get a nice final image when it, the image is rendered. Now let's have a little talk about rendering and see where we go. If I just drag my menu bar over here, um, if any time you can't see everything on this bar, just putting your little mouse until you can see uh, the hand icon, you can just click and drag to see the rest of it. Now rendering. If I just uh, click this render production, um, we can have a little look at what rendering is. So what's happened there? The it, it, To start with, it looks pretty similar looking at the two uh, images there, but uh, there are some differences. Um, now uh, this image here is generated by your computer using the 3D graphics card and the, there's, there are limits to what a, a 3D graphics card can produce in terms of realism. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a process I believe known as a sort of rasterized um, uh, processing to generate your image whereas this is uh, generated using uh, a process known as ray tracing um, which is, is slightly different and you can get much more realistic and advanced features on here now, to start with, this image isn't, isn't looking too, too great because everything looks very bland, there's no shadows, you know, you can't really see what's going on. So let's, uh, let's have a look about how we can make this a bit better. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change my uh, default renderer. Um, now, if I click that little button there, it's the render setup button. It brings up all the uh, all the dialogue for how my uh, render is going to work, um, and now there's something called a render engine. So if I just uh, I just scroll down there in the common tab, so there's different tabs here. Scroll down in the common tab until I could see this assign renderer. Uh, you want to uh, click that to expand it, and then when it says production, you click the little uh, three button the the three dots here. Because um, at the moment it says default scanline renderer, and I want to use this render, the one called Mental Ray. Click OK. Now Mental Ray is a very advanced renderer. This is one that one that is used on um, sort of high-end productions, and it's uh, a really really good way to get your image to look very very nice. So all I've done is I've uh, I've clicked uh, to assign that Mental Ray renderer. If I click Render again. Nah, nothing really looks different. It, it did slightly different process when it was rendering and everything looked a bit a bit square, but there was uh, initially no real difference. The difference comes when we start to introduce, thing, uh, introduce lights into this. I'm just going to minimize this tab here so I've got a bit more space to work with. There we go. So, back in this, uh, in this Create tab, I'm going to change to a, a, another sub-tab uh, in the one that is called Lights. Uh, by default it's bringing up these photometric lights, we don't need to worry about those, let's go to standard lights. And I'm going to drop in a light called a skylight. Um, no, I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to go to a mental ray area spot, so that wherever you see this mister in, uh, in 3D Studio Max it means mental ray. So I'm going to click mental ray area spot, I'm going to middle mouse click in my main window so it's, uh, I know that it's active. And if I press Alt W, I can see all my uh, all my viewports here. Now, uh, like many objects in 3D Studio Max, to create this light, it's a click and a drag. You want to start the click where you want the light to start and drag it in the direction you want it to point. So I'm going to click and drag. So I created it and then I dragged it. So this is a target light. Um, so there's a little target there. So the light will always point at it. You can just see the icon of it in this window here. You'll also note how different this uh, this view down here looks. So just middle mouse clicking back here to make sure I'm in the right window. So if I want to switch between windows, I I use a middle mouse click just to make sure that uh, I'm not going to do anything to the scene. I'm just selecting the window. So I've selected this left one, and I'm going to scroll with my middle uh, mouse button to uh, scroll out. And you can see that the light is actually sat on the floor. I want to push it up so that the light is no longer on the floor. It's uh, in the air. And uh, looking at the scene, it's not lit as I want it. In fact, I think the light's coming from the wrong direction. So I can just move that around. Ah, oh, there we go. Much better. Until the light is shining from the direction I want. 
So there, if I uh, go back into this view um, and just uh, render again. There we go, you can see straight away it's lit and it's got a shadow. Now the shadow is not very nice there, you can see it's got these big gaps in it. Um, that's because, uh, if, let me get a slightly different view. So I'm going to press Q for my select tool, Z to frame up on my teapot and just go to there. So now you can see this little gap between the teapot uh, lid and the teapot body. If I render that, you can see it basically comes as see-through, so you can see straight through the teapot um, to the plane behind it, and you've got that ring on the shadow as well. Um, that is uh, is no good. Um, so what we want to do is we want to stop that from happening. Again, in the render setup, I want to uh, in the common tab, I want to click this button that says Force Two Sided. Now that, what that means is if you imagine that this uh, this teapot is made up of lots and lots of squares, in fact, I can show you, you can see that it's made up of all these squares, and these squares, by default, are only visible in one direction. So I can see it in this direction, but when I look from behind it, it becomes invisible. That's what's happening here. By clicking Force Two-Sided, what it's made, it's done, it's made all the polygons in the scene mean that you can see them from both sides. So if I render again, there we go, you can see it stopped that. I can no longer see through the teapot and the shadows close, so that's, uh, that's not a problem anymore. Looking at this teapot, you can see it's very, very jagged. It's got lots of corners and it, it doesn't look very smooth or realistic. Let's see how we sort that out. Now, I'm going to move from the Create tab into the Modify tab. Now, the Modify tab is where you start to change things. Um, primitive objects, like the ones we've created, have some uh, all have different settings on them. So, the, uh, the teapot here has a radius, um, so I can make the, the radius bigger or smaller, and that changes the general size of the, uh, the teapot. That's uh, irrespective of the scale of it that we saw in the previous tutorial. The one that we'll want to look at here is segments, and that dictates how many... Uh, well, basically, how complex the shape is. The easiest way to show it is if I start pressing the plus key, you can see that each up click creates more and more polygons on the surface of this object. And at 12, if I were to re-render, you can see that this teapot is now a much smoother shape. There's no jagged corners on there. So it's much more useful for what we want to do. You can also do things like turn off some of the options. So you can turn off the body of the teapot. You can say you don't want it to have a lid. You just want it to be like an open teapot um, if you wanted. You can do that if you want. That's fine. Um, you can turn off the uh, turn off the spout. And now it's basically a, a lovely smooth shaped mug there that you've got. Um, or you can, uh, yeah, turn off, I don't know, turn off the handle, turn on the lid, and you've got a lovely sugar bowl glorious each each primitive item is going to have different objects that you've uh, that you can change most of them are to do with how many segments it has so how smooth or how many polygons the uh, the object has um, the beauty of this is you can put them up and you can turn them down as you want so that's uh, that's as simple as a teapot comes and you know you can just keep going up uh, to 64 it seems to be the maximum uh, but uh, you generally don't need that 12 seems to be a good number uh, I kind of like. Okay, so we've solved the problem with the shadows, and we have solved the problem with the transparency in the uh, in the side of the teapot. Okay, so let's have a little look. Let's do a render. Yeah, that's not looking bad. We've got a shadow. Uh, it looks very smooth now. Uh, the only problem is everything's kind of green. Um, so uh, let's sort that out. Now. This tab here is the material editor. Um, when you open it up, depending on how everything's set up, it might look like that. Now, uh, I'm not going to use that today because it's a little bit big and a little bit complex, in my opinion, if you're just starting out. Um, and plus, because of my limited recording space, it's kind of hard for you to see. So I'm going to click Modes and put it in the Compact Material Editor, which I think for beginners is just a bit more user-friendly. Now what you have here, these circles represent different materials that you're using in the scene. So if I just take this first one and drop it on the teapot, let's have a play around and see what we can come up with. So here you can just see, the, basically the only changes I've made this teapot grey. 
So that material is grey, that material is grey. Let's change its colour. I'm going to change its uh, ambient colour. I'm going to make it a nice green teapot. Uh, no, everything in the scene is kind of green at the moment. Let's make it mm, orange, that like pale orange there, kind of a terracotta colour. So I've, uh, I've changed it there. If you uh, look in your viewpoint, you can see its colour has changed there. I'm just going to turn off this edged faces mode and click render again there we go so we've changed the, the, the color essentially of the object now you note that this button means that the, the textures are linked so if you change ambience the diffuse will change uh, don't worry too much about what they they mean the one what I want to have a look at though is this specular highlight setting now think of specular as how shiny an object is so if I turn that up you can see I get this little hot spot there and when I render there we go. And that's a bit more interesting. We've got this nicer sort of glaze look to it now. It almost looks a little bit like a, a, a ceramic uh, pot that's uh, got a light varnish on. If I want it to be shinier, I can push this glossiness value up. And you see it's making that uh, this little ramp here much tighter and sharper. And the little highlight up here is becoming smaller. So if I put up that up to a value of 40 do another render there you can see that it, it, it looks shiny now because when something is shiny uh, the reflections it creates are much sharper and vivid so it's uh, it's created that look there um, now that these that's how you change sort of values in a default material but I'm going to show you something that's a little bit more um, advanced it's kind of like a shortcut to getting nice textures um, I'm going to click on this button here that says standard and it brings up this big list of materials and if you go into this mental ray tab you want to double click on where it says arc and design double click there now what that's done is it's changed it to a special material architects and uh, designers surprisingly uh, like to use this because it's a very good way to quickly um, set up textures for things like buildings and for objects so I'm going to change this material uh, well let's do a render first and see what it looks like So, something slightly different here. What you have is you now have a reflection of the floor in the teapot. You also have a reflection of the teapot spout in the teapot. So straight away we've introduced reflection, so it's a little bit more complicated. Um, I'm going to change the material from uh, the default. You've got this big list of, uh, of um, preset settings for it. So uh, I'm going to choose this uh, glazed ceramic because uh, teapots generally are made of, uh, of ceramics, of pot. Uh, and you can see it's changed it so that the highlight looks a bit different. If I do a render, yeah, it's just subtly different there. Um, it's not made a huge difference, but the reflections are a bit more realistic. If I want to change the colour back to my nice orange colour, maybe make it a bit more vivid in the red and push up how, uh, how deep the colour is. Re-render. There we go, something a bit more interesting there. So that's uh, that's one default setting. Let's have a look at, at putting uh, a wood now on this uh, where the floor is, essentially. Cross re those renders. Okay, so I'm going to go to this next tab. Again, click Standard, Arc and Design. And I'm going to choose this, uh, where is it? Let's Well, let's have a look at two different ones. I'll choose the Glossy Varnish Wood first, and let's drop that on. So notice I just clicked, dragged, and dropped it on the object I wanted to uh, put the texture on. If you get it wrong, so if I oh, I've put it on the teapot by mistake, don't worry, just drag out the other one. It's easily correctable. Press render again. So now we've got this, uh, this shiny wooden surface. Uh, you might want to use that for a dance floor, but I want this to be sort of a kitchen work surface. So for me, that's a bit too, uh, a bit too bright. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change it to this... Uh, satin varnished wood so I don't have to reapply the texture it's already there and a quick re-render there is still a reflection of the teapot in the surface of this wood but it's much more subtle now it's got it's kind of blurred out which gives it a much more realistic look now the back wall I want to change that so I want it to be uh, tile work um, you may have noticed if you've already been having a little look there is this glazed ceramic tiles uh, of course, I don't want to do it in the, in this one because this is the uh, 
this is the floor I want to put it on the uh, the wall here so again select uh, an arc and design material and set that to uh, glaze ceramic tiles and drop it on there yep, I've dropped that in my render view just to confuse myself there there we go and let's render that so there we go we've now got this ceramic tile uh, setting in the background here um, but you might note that this is the grouting of the tile and it's kind of huge relative to the teapot the tiles seem to be ginormous so what we're going to do is we're going to change how big the tiles are now the, the way the tiles are controlled are by a material in within the object or a texture within the, the uh, material you can tell that there's something going on because there's this little M if I click on that it tells me that I'm now in this uh, glacier tiles brackets tiles object uh, so I can now change this the thing I'm going to change is its tiling now if you imagine a texture to be um, a, a square that's got various pixels it could be a picture of a person or in this case a picture of of tiles um, how many the tiling dictates how many times that will be repeated on the object now I want to increase this because the tiles are too big so I want more tiles on there so by increasing it let's increase that to let's say four and four you can see in this little preview that the, the it's changed so there's a lot more tiles and let's render that ah that's not bad at all tell you what that's pretty good actually I'm I think I'm happy with that um, the the tiles look pretty square the grouting meets up with the bottom of the uh, of this surface here so generally that's that's not bad at all um, in your scene depending on the, the shape of the object in fact let me let me do this I'm gonna make it bad so it's uh, it can uh, improve so by pressing Q I'm just going to select this plane and I'm gonna stretch it out that way and then pressing Q and select my teapot, press Z and just scroll in a bit closer. I'll scroll into there. Let's re-render. So now I've stretched that out. It's also stretched the texture out. So now the uh, the tiles kind of look twice as wide as they are high. Now that's not a situation I want to uh, I want to have. I want these tiles square. So let's have a look at how to correct that. So with this uh, tiling selected. Um, so we know that it's wider than it is high. Now these are dictated by what are known as UV coordinates. So if you imagine in, uh, in 3D space you've got X, Y and Z are your dimensions. When you're talking about textures, those are dictated by U and V coordinates. So um, U is the, uh, the horizontal coordinates of a texture and V is the vertical of the texture. So I want to change the horizontal. I know that these textures are about twice as wide as they are high. So if I double the tiling on the U, which is the horizontal, let's see what happens. So it's really shortened those tiles in there. They're a lot closer together in terms of width. They're still probably wider than they are high, maybe by about a factor of maybe 30 percent there so I might just uh, let's bump that up to 10 this isn't going to be an exact thing at this point I just sort of trial and error I'm gonna put a value in see what it looks like and then uh, and then change it still a bit wide for me I'm gonna cancel this render as it's going because uh, I don't need to see it all to know that it's not quite right set that up to 12 and one more time yeah I'm much happy with that these look to be square um, in the same way that uh, you can uh, change the size of the tiles you can uh, change the location of the tiles so if you've got a, a tile sort of the the floor level is halfway up here you might need to change that you could either change it by moving the floor physically down or you could uh, go in here and change the coordinates or the offset of the uh, of the object um, so it, you'd need to change its vertical so by changing this up so I'll say that's uh, a value of point two if I to re-render that you can see that the tiles have actually moved now so they're in a different orientation um, uh, try and keep it the values very small so you're going to be dealing with values of sort of 0 0.01 0 0.02 in this particular instance um, uh, to, to align your texture so I'm going to keep that at zero because I don't need to change it at all so, uh, so there we go so at the moment we've got uh, the texture set up we've got the uh, a basic light setup and we've got the uh, 
or the objects created. So in this tutorial, we've been looking about how to get the render into a mental ray mode. We've been looking about how to apply some nice architecture and design textures and how to tweak those just a little bit to get a more desirable result. Um, and looking about how to uh, um, try and get this final look that we're after. Um, we're going to go into a bit more detail in, a, in the next tutorial. Um, having a look at how to set up some uh, a second light to make it a bit more realistic um, and then how to bring some environment textures in to create some better reflections in this uh, teapot and, uh, and the ceramic tiles here. So uh, we'll see you in the next tutorial.